समस्त जन कल्याण निरत करुणा चिन्मय देव Okay. So last time we saw sutras fifty three and fifty four. So we'll just review a little bit and then we will move on. So we are on this topic of what is this supreme bhakti, right? The supreme bhakti. First of all, it's hard to describe. Very hard to describe. But in verse fifty three, it says, "Who is the vessel for this bhakti? In whom will this bhakti come to? And how does one become a vessel? So how one becomes a vessel for bhakti? Because it's not the easiest thing. You know, our mind is so uh, logical, sometimes so rational, that it cannot conceive of developing a relationship with a form of God." and it seems very difficult it seems unheard of we might not have grown up with it we might not be used to it so how does one become a vessel one becomes a vessel just by spending time reading about maybe that form of bhagavan saints and sages who worshiped that form of bhagavan any scripture of that bhagavan or bhagavati when we spend time immersed in that slowly the heart melts and slowly we develop this kind of love we develop this kind of taste this kind of flavor and why is this important this is important because our minds and our hearts are sometimes full of dirt they're full of dirt and although vedanta is a wonderful purifier nahi nyanena sadrisham pavitram iha vidyate there's no greater purifier than knowledge it's a fact but to even be able to hold on to that knowledge we need a heart that's full of love hmm? so becoming a patra or a vessel means my being able to develop a relationship with a form of bhagavan or bhagavati whoever's dear to me and what happens when we become fit vessels or patra the word patra is used the word patra means that we then surrender ourselves and sometimes people get this wrong uh not like this wrong understanding of the meaning surrender huh surrender doesn't mean that we just give everything to god and we don't do anything that's not what surrendering means surrendering means developing such a beautiful relationship with god that i surrender my will what we surrender is not our effort what we surrender is our will our own selfish motive our own selfish desire we completely surrender our will and instead we seek to receive god's will so this act of surrendering doesn't mean that don't do anything don't do any action it means surrender your will make yourself so empty so that you receive god's will and in that direction then we must act that's called surrendering hmm? that's how we then become an instrument of god and in this we experience such a divine love so in 54 it says this love that we experience is guna rahitam it's devoid of all kinds of attributes devoid of desire not poisoned by desire kamana rahitam because it's guna rahitam it's without any sattva rajas tamas it's devoid of desire we are just loving to love and i had posted on the whatsapp chat gurudev's beautiful explanation on love he says the freedom in loving 
is to love, to just love everybody and anybody and give your love. And that is freedom of love. The freedom of love is not wanting anything. Because when we want something, we are bound. If we say, I'm going to love him or her because she does this, and let's see and wait if they love me back, then I will give love. And if they don't, then maybe I won't give love. That love is bondage. And if we are giving love and then expecting, expecting for love to come back, that love is bondage. This love that Bhakti gives us is so freeing because we are just loving to love, whether we are loved back or not, whether they are continuing to give us something or not, whether they recognize or not. It's just this love that's not tainted by any guna, sattva, rajas, tamas, and that will come, more explanation will come later, and not tainted by desire. And it's the love Pratiksha, pratikshana vardhamana. It keeps growing. This ultimate bhakti is the one that keeps growing. How we saw before that when we know somebody, we start loving them more. And the more we love them, the more we want to love them. So this bhakti is a, it's true bhakti when it just keeps growing. Like you know, we start to get uh, goosebumps. We start to, tears well up in our eyes. We start to feel really these emotions of love. Avichinnam, it's unbroken. We are only on the same tune, the same sound, the same song, meaning that song of love. Our lives revolve around the song of love and we're never away from God. And sukshma, sukshma means it's very subtle. The more subtle something is, the more pervasive it is. So my love for God is not only in that particular form or that particular image, but it pervades everything else. It pervades all people, all beings. And Anubhava Rupa. And it's directly experienced. I know it because I experience it. Nobody has to tell me about it. I don't have to hear about it from anybody because it's a direct experience. So this is that supreme love. This is what it means to love, to love freely, to love beautifully, and to just love. Now, what happens when people have this kind of bhakti? So now we will see verse number 55. Tat prapya, tat prapya, tadeva valokayati, tadeva valokayati. Tadeva Shrinoti, Tadeva Shrinoti, Tadeva Bhashayati, Tadeva Bhashayati, Tadeva Chintayati, Tadeva Chintayati. When one gains that bhakti, Tat Prapya, having attained this Tat, supreme bhakti, Tadeva Valokayati, that is the only thing one sees. Tat eva shunoti. That's the only thing one hears. Tat eva alone bhashayati. Means that alone one speaks. Tat eva chintayati. That alone one contemplates upon. So having reached the supreme state, one only thinks about that, sees that, hears that, speaks that, nothing else. So what happens in life is we are what our drishti is. Hmm? Drishti means vision. Drishti means vision. So when our drishti or vision is that of love, is that of bhakti, that, that's the only thing we will see. That's the only thing we would see. So for example, for a, there are, you know, there's that story of Yudhishthira and Duryodhana. And they were told to go to the marketplace. And both of them, you know, the teacher said, go to the marketplace and tell me what you see. And Yudhishthira said, I saw all great and amazing people. Duryodhana said, I saw all terrible people. They were all creating trouble. You know, they were all creating such a ruckus. They went to the same place, the same market. But Yudhishthira saw goodness. 
and Duryodhana saw negativity. Why is that? Because of their vision. Mm -hmm. So for a bhakta, their vision is always to see goodness. See, it might not be super possible in the beginning to see God in everyone. Huh? Because when we say, okay, see God in everybody, see God in every being, the first thing we think of is that person is just not like God. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that person is not like God. I don't know how to see God in that person. So if we can't see God in that person, at least see goodness, right? At least see goodness in that person. And in everything, we can see goodness. See how one who sees dosha, one who sees defects, what do they see? They see the sun and they're looking at the sun and they're saying, ah, oh, the sun is just giving me too much heat today. I don't understand why the sun is like this, you know? Or they'll look at the moon and say, the, the moon, is, it's, so, it's so full of dark spots. You know, it's not, it, look at that moon. It's just full of all kinds of spotty things. Or they'll look at the river Ganga and they'll say, ah, this Ganga, so many people come here. And because so many people come here, it may be dirty and all of these things happen here. And this will be their vision when they see all of this. But somebody who's in the habit of seeing goodness, they look at the sun. They'll say, ah, oh, that is Surya Bhagavan. Huh? Giving light, giving heat, giving energy to everybody so selfless. They'll look at the moon and see how that moon actually nourishes all the crops. Uh, the, the, how the moon keeps us cool and so pleasant to look at in all ways and forms. And when you look at the moon, you see Shiva only because of the crescent moon is on Bhagavan Shiva. Or when they look at the Ganga, she's a mother. She's the greatest purifier. Everybody goes to her and takes part. So the same thing, when a Bhakta looks at that, they really look at it with a different vision. They're always seeing divinity. So when the, the nightingale is singing, they're saying, oh, the nightingale is singing for God only. Or the bumblebee is buzzing. They're buzzing for God only. Hmm? So in every which way, every which direction that they see, they see the earth uh, revolving around the sun. The earth is doing pradakshina. It's like the earth is doing pradakshina. So this is such a fascinating way that they've got the eye to see, if not God, goodness. And that's all that they see because that's their vision. That's a vision of a bhakta. Tat eva avalokayati. Hmm? And even in the, you know, when we, when the, even in the asuric acts, even when we uh, read Ramayana, there are all these asuras. Asuras means these demons. And this deer, marich, this marich deer who tempted Sita Devi and who went there to distract Sri Rama. Even in marich, they find bhakti. Why? Because Maharaj said that uh, if I don't tempt Rama, Ravana will kill me. But if I go and tempt Rama, Rama will kill me. And I would rather die in the hands of Rama. So I will tempt him. So even in that Maharaj, there's Bhakti. Huh? So this is the kind of I that the Bhakta has. Tadeva Avalokaya. Then, Tadeva Shruti and the Bhakta, anything they hear is also love. They see it as love. They see it as goodness. So if somebody is scolding them, somebody is yelling at them, they also see it as love. They also see it as love. Huh? One time, a couple was yelling at each other. So their friend said, no, what are you doing? How come you're yelling at each other? And they said, this is the way we love. <laughs> this is the way we love. This, this is it. You know, even in that also we love. So there's no, don't worry, nothing is wrong here. That's just the way we love. So even in that scolding, even in that yelling, even in whatever, whatever they're, they, they're, they hear, there's also bhakti there. In the thunder that they hear, in the honk that they hear, there's also bhakti there. They're able to see it. 
तदेव शुणुक्ति तदेव भाषे and everything that they speak is also full of love they they uh, the one of the most beautiful things in mm, sharada devi sharada ma the uh, wife of shri ramakrishna paramahamsa ji she said that the worst thing we can do is fault finding to keep finding and looking for faults that's the worst thing we can do so she would always speak to everybody with love whoever came to her no matter how much of a a sinner he or she was no matter what their background was she always spoke with love she always spoke with love because she said this is also a, a bhakta this is also a person who's on the path so let me if i cannot connect with this person as god let me at least connect with this person as somebody who's on the path somebody who's on the path of goodness and tadeva chinta and that's all the bhakta thinks about means the bhakta the devotee's mind is in that it's around that only nothing else can enter the mind is so protected the mind of the bhakta is so protected so much so that even if negative tendencies want to come they turn away it's <laughs> that i cannot i cannot enter this bhakta's mind the bhakta's mind is too too pure it's too too beautiful that the negative asuras try to come but they they cannot they cannot touch it they cannot touch it because it's ever soaked in the love of god mm -hmm. so today now we will see uh some things from ramayan now this is a beautiful portion in ramayan i wanted to share with you where now she, he, i'll give you the background Sri Rama here is uh, he is searching for Sita Devi. So now Sita Devi had been taken by Ravana, and it's rainy season now, and so Sri Rama is just going around the forest, and he's with Lakshman Ji, and everywhere he goes, there's like a nice, uh, a very beautiful thought that he has, beautiful reveling that he has. So let us see here. So first is he sees the sight of a peacock, and so he he sees the sight of a peacock dancing at the rain cloud because the peacocks they dance when they see rain, and normally when we see this, what do we think of? Let's take a picture. Let's get our phones. Let's take a picture. This is so awesome. Let me post it, right? But what is Sri Rama thinking? he's saying it reminds him of devotees that become delighted upon seeing other devotees so vision huh so the way peacocks dance is that it's it's how devotees become delighted this is what shri rama is seeing hmm? so and and he says the peacock desires nothing from the clouds nothing but it just it just starts dancing it just starts dancing out of delight now shri rama also he sees the sight of water bearing clouds so the clouds are you know coming so close to the surface that they're about to rain and so what is his thought process you know when the clouds appear as though they touch the earth he says wise people when they accumulate knowledge it makes them more down to Uh, so this is what he's thinking that wise people they're accumulating knowledge and it's making them humble because vidya tadati vinayam knowledge brings us humility then sight of the raindrop so there's a sight of the raindrops here huh? it's hitting the ground very very hard so sometimes you know when it's raining it hits the ground very very hard so what is bhagwan rama thinking says those with noble virtues put up with the taunts of the wicked how they're so balanced that no matter what taunts the wicked will give them they they put up with it they're able to bear it hmm? then he says here he sees the ponds are filled with water ponds are totally totally filled with water 
And what is he saying? What does this remind him of? It's virtues filling up the heart of the noble. Mm -hmm. And it's virtues filling up the heart of the noble. And when the, these waters flow into the ocean, they become still like the devotee was found Bhagavan. So just see, just seeing this, this is where his mind goes to such great heights. Then he sees frogs croaking. So some of us would want to run away because <laughs> the frogs are croaking. But Sri Rama says, it's heard in all four directions, reminding one of the chanting of the mantras of the Vedas. So, ah, try this a bit. So in this way, this is how a bhakta's mind, their speech, their hearing, everything is just in God or in goodness. That's all that they're in. Hmm? Now, there is another way to look at this, right? From a higher standpoint, from a Vedantic standpoint, Gurudev has given that in the, in the commentary. So I will also touch upon that. And if we take this as pure consciousness, then there is this beautiful verse in Chandogya Upanishad. So I'll share it with you, then I'll explain. Hmm? So here we go. That divine state is Yatra Nanyat Pashyati, Nanyat Shrunuti, Nanyat Vijanati, Sabhuma. Atha yatra anyat pashyati, anyat shunuti, anyat vijanati, tadalpam. Yo vai bhuma tadamritam. Atha tadalpam tan martyam. Sabhagavaha kasmin pratishtitaiti. Sve mahimni yadivana mahimni. So here, Sanat Kumara, he is instructing Narada. And he says this infinite state this infinite real the realization of the infinite is where one doesn't see anything else one doesn't hear anything else and one doesn't know anything else but the finite state is that in which one sees something one hears something else and one knows something else right so what does it mean here Upon realizing who we are, there is no other. In that deepest love and deepest knowledge, there is no other. Because everything, in from the bhakti, bhakta standpoint, we say everything is a play of Bhagavan. Everything is a play of Bhagavan. From the ultimate Vedantic standpoint, we say everything is just consciousness. So everything is just consciousness. Whatever I'm experiencing now is just consciousness. It's consciousness flowing through my mind, through my eyes, through this computer, through you. Everything is just that consciousness. There's nothing else than that. There's no, the, the eyes cannot, ex, the mind cannot exist without consciousness. The eyes cannot exist without consciousness. The object cannot exist without consciousness. Nothing can exist without consciousness or awareness. Nothing exists outside of consciousness or awareness. If you think deeply about it, right? Is there any experience that you've had outside of awareness? So everything exists in awareness. And everything, therefore, is only awareness. So the highest state is when we truly realize that it is just consciousness that is there. We're not seeing anything else because consciousness alone is. We're not hearing anything else. We're not knowing anything else because conscious, consciousness alone is. And so if whether we see it that way, that is also infinite love, whether we see it as the way of the bhakta, that is also that is called Bhuma, infinite. Mm -hmm. This is supreme bhakti. Now, 
Maharaji says, I know that this supreme bhakti, which was spoken about, is not as easy to gain. He says to us, I know it's not as easy to, keep, to, to gain this ultimate state of love. But so what can we do? What about us? Is there a pathway for us? So he says, now I'm going to talk about the secondary kind of bhakti. Hmm? Maybe we will see <clears throat> one or two sutras from here. So sutra 56. Now we are in the secondary bhakti. Gauri tridha, gauni tridha, guna bhedat, guna bhedat. Arta di be dadva, Arta di be dadva. So here he says, now the, remember the first or the primary kind of bhakti is that which is love, tainted, not tainted by desire, not tainted by desire, not tainted by any guna, that which is unbroken, that which is ever growing, that which is directly experienced that which is just love. But here he says, Gauni, the secondary love is threefold. And they are divided according to two categories. One is Guna Bhedat, according to the difference in the mental disposition or the Guna, Sattva Rajas Tamas, and Arta Di Bhedat, according to the type of desire that one seeks. So, First, let's see the gunas, right? What is tamasic bhakti? Tamasic bhakti or tamasic devotion is when people pray to Bhagavan to harm others, to ha cause harm to others, to you know make others fall, to make others suffer, all this kind of black magic, you know? There was one uh, person, he was praying to Bhagavan. Huh? He was praying to Bhagavan. And he had always a constant uh, rival with his neighbor, you know. And Bhagavan knew. So he was praying to Bhagavan. So Bhagavan said, what do you want? But before I give you what you want, let me tell you something. Whatever I give you, your neighbor will get double. So this guy was so upset. Now <laughs> Bhagavan's going to give me something, but whatever he gives me, my neighbor will get double. And I don't like my neighbor. And so what did he ask? He said, Bhagavan, you make me blind in one eye. Huh? So that his neighbor becomes blind in both eyes. This is the kind of bhakti that people have. Hmm? But they don't even want other people to rise. They have such rivals with other people that they want only harm to come to them. And so they pray for that. Let this person suffer. Let this person go through that. They pray for that. And some people also feel that they're responsible for giving the fruits of action to the others. That's only Bhagavan's job. That's not your job or my job, that this person should learn their lesson. This person should suffer. I'm going to make them suffer. All kinds of things. That is all tamasik bhakti. Hmm? Whenever we want to cause harm. Rajasik bhakti is whenever we are devoted to God for our own selfish pursuits. Hmm? Whenever we, we are devoted to God and we're seeking things from God for our own selfish gains, whatever it is that we want to pursue in life. So we use God for the world. Hmm? <laughs> and then sattvic bhakti is when we pray to God to attain God. That is also not ultimate bhakti. Hmm? Because ultimate bhakti, remember, is that where we are praying to God, loving God, and whether I get moksha or not, whether I attain you or not, it doesn't really matter. I'm just loving to love. But sattvic bhakti is a kind of bhakti that says, please help me attain you. Please purify my mind. Please help me come closer to you. That is sattvic bhakti. So that is also in the secondary form of bhakti. Hmm? Then there is this Heda in ch chapter 7 of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavan Krishna says that there are four kinds of devotees who come to me. They're called Artha, Artharthi, Jignyasu, and Jnani. 
Arta means the one who's distressed, who goes to Bhagavan because they're distressed. They're in deep, deep sorrow. They're deep, deep sorrow and they really want help and they're only seeking Bhagavan. This is like Gajendra in Bhagavata. Artharthi is the one who goes to Bhagavan to seek pleasure, to seek something in the world. So I want maybe more money, a great family, good health. I want to get a bigger place. They're seeking Bhagavan for their own pleasure, for their own comfort, for their own needs. It's also very Rajasik Bhakti. And then the Jignyasu is the one who's seeking God out of curiosity. That I really want to know who you are. I really want to know all about you. Seeking God, please tell me about you. And the fourth one is Jnani. The Jnani or that the, the wise person, they are not in this category. They are in the supreme bhakti. Because Jnani just seeks God out of their own fulfillment. They just love to love. So here, these are the kinds of secondary bhaktas or secondary types of devotion. The ones who seek Bhagavan for distress, to seek Bhagavan for pleasure, their, their wealth, their own personal gain. The ones who seek Bhagavan out of curiosity. But you know what Bhagavan says? Even if they're seeking me for something else, they're still my devotees. Because at least they're thinking about me. And if we think about Bhagavan, he will pull us. <laughs> he will pull us to make us even think higher. In that way, even Ravana is a bhakti. Even Ravana has bhakti because he keeps thinking about Sri Rama. Huh? He keeps thinking about Sri Rama. He's like, I, I'm going to fight with that Sri Rama. I'm going to get him. I'm going to finish Sri Rama. That way, he also has bhakti because he keeps thinking about Rama. In that way, an atheist also can be said to have bhakti because they keep thinking, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. They keep thinking about God. <laughs> so they're, athe they're atheists, but they also keep thinking about God. So they also have bhakti. Hmm? So Bhagavan says, even if our bhakti is secondary, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Because in some way, you just pray to me and I will pull you. I will pull you. And this is the beautiful story of the Vamana Avatar. So if you remember Raja Bali, huh? Raja Bali, he was a king, right? And he was going to make this big, big sacrifice. And if he made this big sacrifice, he would gain unparalleled power. So somebody had to stop his sacrifice. So Bhagavan Vishnu Kram says, Vamana Avatar, a dwarf, and says to him, I am a Brahmana. I am a. Please, I ask something from your yajna. And Raja Bali said, "Whatever you ask, I will give." Because usually, when saints sages would go ask anything, the kings would always give. But his guru, Raja Bali's guru, said, "Oh, you be, better be careful. He's no ordinary dwarf." But Raja Bali said, "I gave my word. So what do you want?" So Vamana Avatar said, I want three steps of land. And so Raja Bali said, oh, just three? You're so small, you're a dwarf. Are you sure you don't want anything else? And he said, no, I don't want anything else. Just three steps of land. And so Raja Bali said, okay. Now Vamana Avatar grew so big. And with the first step, he stepped on the whole earth. The second, the entire heaven. The third, he didn't have anywhere to put his foot. And Raja Bali said, you put it on my head. You put it on my head. Therefore, Bhagavan put it on Raja Bali's head and conquered his ego. Hmm? So what does this show us? This shows us that all we have to do is give Bhagavan three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. And in that three minutes, he's going to grow so big, like Vamana Avatar, that he will conquer our entire world. He will conquer our entire realm of heaven. And then he will finally conquer our ego. Mm -hmm. But it starts with three minutes. 
So even if our bhakti is secondary, it's okay. Just keep going. Just keep flowing. And at some point in time, we will lose ourselves completely in the divine. And that is the only thing we will see. That's the only thing we will hear. The only thing we will speak about. The only thing we will think. Because there is only that. And there will be no more. I, the Bhagavan. That is called Bhakti. So now we will stop here and uh, do the some discussion.